Thanks for joining our public webinar today. My name is Jeannie Borum and I am part of the Sign World corporate staff and I'll be moderating this session. Um, just a quick overview for those of you who may never have been on a session in the past or watched one of our recorded sessions so you can understand what to expect for the next hour. Um, first off, we're gonna allow each of our owners to give a quick overview and background on themselves, where they're located, how long they've been in business, some targets um, for their business financially and or sales targets, et cetera. Um, talking about customers and a little bit about their background. So you'll get a, a high level overview of each of them. And then when, that, uh, when those introductions are over, we will turn the floor over to our participants. And I do see quite a few of you uh, logged in at the moment. I see about 10, it looks like at the moment. So we are to ask you um, in order, we'll, ask, we'll call you out by name, ask you to share where you're located geographically, and then please uh, go ahead with your first question for the group. Uh, we likely won't have time for a second round of questions. So we do ask you to keep it to one question only. Um, likely other questions that are asked might be ones that you're thinking of too. So with this many attendees, I'm sure we'll get through lots of great questions for the day today. So with that said, let's turn it over to our owners to give a quick introduction of themselves. So Margie, may I start with you, please? Sure, that'd be great. So um, welcome everyone. My name is Margie. I'm um, the owner of American Science Studio and we're um, experts at visual branding. Uh, we're located in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, we just turned five on June 1st. So five full years. And um, our location is around 2,500 square feet. We have five full-time employees and two part-time. And um, it looks like we're going to be at about $1.2 million in sales this year, but I think we're going to hit a stretch goal of 1.5. Um, but we'll, by the end of this week, we'll actually have in all of our sales um, that, that we did last year. So um, halfway through the year, we've done exactly what we did um, in the full year last year. So that's feeling really good. Um, our biggest customer um, is, is a bank. And they have five brands. They um, are about $270,000 of our business. And um, their average order size is around 8,500. And then right behind that is commercial uh, real estate, which we're doing about $110,000 um, so far with them this year. And we're at about a $12,000 average order size. Um, my Wonder. background? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my background is um, product development and um, sourcing. So I worked for an apparel manufacturer for 17 years and uh, traveled a lot internationally. And um, this was a, a great um, compliment to what we do here now. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction, Margie. If we can go to Dr. Mike Voling for your introduction next, Mike. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mike, Georgetown Sign Company, just on the northern side of Austin, Texas. Uh, shoot, I always hate when a call comes in on these. Uh, we have, I'm down to five employees right now. Uh, my installer just quit, but I've got a new one starting next week. So it'll be at six uh, full time plus myself. Uh, let's see, square footage. I've got 3,000 square feet in my original location. And earlier this year, I signed a lease for an additional 1,000 square feet that's located maybe a half mile down the road where I do all my vehicle wraps now. Uh, as far as sales levels, year one was 230s or give or take. Year two is 500. Last year, I hit a million. This year, I'm probably going to come a little short of my goal of 1.2, uh, right on track for 900, but we had some weird internet stuff going on this year. So uh, background of myself, mechanical engineering degree, uh, quickly found I enjoyed sales and marketing a lot more than the engineering work and moved into uh, sales and marketing. And most of my career was, if you drive around town, you see those cameras looking at you at all the intersections. Well, that was me. I got that whole industry started in the early 90s. Uh, don't worry, they're there to get you through the light faster, not a ticket. And uh, just kind of progressed a couple of different startups. Uh, early retired, got bored, went back, got an MBA in entrepreneurism from University of Texas and had so much fun with that. 
while I'm st while I started the sign company, you know, four years ago, I was just started my doctoral process. Uh, so I've got a doctorate in business administration and strategy and innovation, which I completed about a year ago. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that background, Mike. No, I think you got it all. Thank you so much. Good. All right, let's move on to Stephanie. If you can go ahead and give an introduction of yourself, please. Hey there, I'm Stephanie McEwen from Signcraft Solutions. Uh, we are located in Wake Forest, North Carolina, just slightly north of Raleigh. We've been in business for 14 years. Uh, we currently have 10,000 square feet of space with an additional 5,000 of side yard, fenced in side yard that we've been able to use as well. And that's been great to be able to expand that way. We currently have 16 employees um, and then there would be Bob and myself also. Uh, we are looking for two more, so we're a little short right now on that. Um, our, we're on track to be over 2 million this year. Um, large jobs, uh, doing a lot of property management and large complexes, things are building around here. So 143,000 so far this year with Palisades, um, which is building signage inside and outside that just keeps growing and continues on. Uh, there's another uh, Thomas Park, it's 116,000. With High Woods Properties, we've done about 83,000. So a lot of that sort of thing that is um, interior signage focused mostly, high-end wall wraps, uh, just kind of decking out a building and, and making it look really great. My background was in allied health and uh, I worked largely part-time or per diem as I raised a family. So I have not been necessarily your typical career woman or entrepreneur, but always wanted to have a business, um, raised the kids to, to be able to do that. And so we just kind of decided it was our turn when the, the opportunity arose and uh, we've enjoyed it. It's been good. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Jack? Morning, everybody. I'm Jack Werner. I joined Signal back in 1995 as a sign roll operation. Uh, 1,100 square feet, one employee, 10 years later, ended up at 1.3 million in sales with a staff of 11. Then sold that operation to join Ken Ken, our founder at the corporate office to learn his end of the business, finished buying him out in 2014, nine years ago. I'm now the present owner of Signwell. So as I answer questions, that I'll answer only the questions that go to training and policy. I'll let the other owners answer about experience. Uh, my Thank largest you, customer Jeff. was, was uh, a regional developer for Subway, good for about 250000 a year. I did a lot of work for Dave & Buster's Worldwide making game graphics. Uh, I came out of wholesale food distribution beforehand. Very good. Thank you, Jack. All right, now we're gonna turn the floor over to our participants for you to be able to ask your questions today. Again, there are many of you on the call. We've got about uh, 13, it looks like logged in. So I do ask you to keep it to a single question and to our owners, if I can ask you to be brief with your responses, that would be great. That way we don't go hopefully too far over the hour. So with that said, uh, the first person I had that logged in was Omar. And Omar, I do see your question in the Q&A box. Would you like to come off the of mute and uh, say the question yourself or? Let me watch and see if you do. Very good. Would you like to go ahead with the question for today, Omar? Yeah, so I met Jack uh, a while back and we've been chatting back and forth and I really uh, think he's uh, very black and white and I think he's really on the money. My biggest question is really fundamentally is the business development uh, when you start out within the first soft launch, hard launch, grand opening, uh, the business development transitioning from a uh, an idea or what I like to call a uh, uh, cold lead into a permanent relationship. How could you please elaborate on your, how do you do that? Uh, how do you make those relationships uh, sort of transition into more of a permanent sort of turnkey solution so that when people reach out to you, you are their guy, you are their man. 
Absolutely. Acquiring customers is one of the key parts of this business. So how do you acquire those leads and convert them into long-term customers? Uh, let's start with our oldest operation owner with Stephanie. Stephanie, how do you acquire your customers and how do they become long-term customers today? I, we're a big believer in trust. People you know, want to work with people that they trust, that they can rely on. Um, so if we're consistently doing what we're saying we're doing, it's easy to not only keep that client, but have that person refer us to other people as well. Um, our biggest client to date happened um, on a cold call that we never do. And I would say probably in all of our history, we've done, I don't know, maybe 25 of them. It's just, it's almost a big no-no. Uh, but we had somebody and she was twiddling her thumbs and we sent her up to an area where there was a new healthcare facility going in. And uh, the secretary said, it's your lucky day. I, you know, my boss is a little upset with his, his sign guy. And so he said, if you can make this little memorial plaque, we'll talk. So we sent it off to Gemini, which is a um, vendor that uh, we were introduced to by Sign World. And um, they were thrilled to death with it, and it just grew from there. And now we do huge amounts for of work for them throughout the state, and it just keeps on building. Wonderful, thank you, Stephanie. Margie, how about you? How'd you acquire some of your first customers, and how have you turned them into long-term relationships today? Yeah, um, so pretty much my largest customer is the person I met almost um, 90 days in. And um, it was just get to know you and uh, little jobs, little jobs, uh, setting up um, processes, becoming an expert in the field, and then just communicating that back and forth with them. And now, you know, I do five bank branches with them. So it's really just about being out in the market and face-to-face um, -face meeting people, shaking hands, um, you know, creating trust like Stephanie mentioned, but, you know, also just asking questions. It's not even that we sell um, a product, we really um, solve problems. So if you can find out what the problem is, then there's, it's really easy to, to make a recommendation of where you, you take that customer. And Margie, where did you find that customer 90 days in? Was that through a networking group or a lead? How did you find that person? Sure. So um, in the community where our business is located, there's a holiday um, time of year where they put um, vinyl on windows um, with different holiday displays. And we donated our time to install those. It was, I think, 12 windows and, you know, maybe four hours of our time. And then we got invited to the event, which was sponsored by a bank. And we met the bank. Very good. Wonderful story. Thank you. Dr. Mike. Yeah, I think in the beginning, you're going to get your leads coming from networking groups, whether it's Chamber, BNI, whatever. And don't be afraid to spend money on pay-per-click because that's going to generate immediate opportunities. Even if you're not open, you can always outsource it to another sign world company, suppliers, whatever. Uh, how do you convert them? It's real simple. Do the job. You be responsive. You listen. You, you uh, take care of the customer. You take care of the customer, they're going to take care of you. Uh, we met our single biggest client that generates probably 150 to 200 a year in revenue uh, from placing my original sign maker, who's now my right hand guy, into a BNI chapter. And he got introduced to somebody who we now do, you know, quite a few vehicle wraps a year for. Uh, but the key thing is consistent, be honest, be, have integrity, and just when they reach out, reach out back, treat them with respect, get them the answers, perform, and the rest is, that's how you do it in any industry. And the same is true in science. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Um, and since this is not a training related question, I'll go ahead and skip Jack's uh, feedback for that one. So we'll go on to our next participant. Uh, ben, if you can take yourself off of mute, uh, tell the group where you're from geographically and go ahead with a question for them today. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your time. I'm Ben. I live in uh, San Diego, California. Uh, my question's kind of a cheat question. Um, when, when you were in our shoes evaluating the sign world business opportunity, what did you not ask about or look into that you wish you had? Great question. 
Uh, let's start with Dr. Mike first, our most uh, newest owner. Yeah, I, I would say understanding employee challenges. It's always been, uh, any industry, you always have challenges. I was just talking with uh, Ryan, my right-hand guy, last week. I had a guy quit out of the blue right before a big job. It's And the installer aspect of it has been pro perhaps the most challenging because I seem they seem to come, they're good for a while, then their performance drops, uh, and then you're cycling through either on my choice or their choice. Uh, so probably understanding how that is going to potentially just cycle through the candidates or employees is probably the biggest surprise I've had in this process. Okay, very good. How about you, Margie? Um. I think probably, I don't know if this answers the question right, but one of the biggest challenges came in just being wearing so many hats, right? Like in a corporate environment, you, you kind of have a lane and you have staff. So like if you need help with your computer, you call IT and all of a sudden you are IT. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if you need your trash taken out, you know, usually housekeeping would come at the end of the day and take your trash out and now you do it. <laughs> so, I mean, that was a little bit of a surprise for me. I, just being naive to um, how many different uh, lanes and then, you know, how do you build a marketing campaign and how do you do um, a lot of things, hiring and such. So um, just, you know, really kind of be open to the idea that you're going to learn a lot. Um, well, I've, I bet I said, I didn't know this would be like drinking water out of a fire hose, but it really, um, that first few months, it's a little surprising, but if you have um, just, keep up what you were doing in your previous life, um, you'll you'll be successful. Very good, thank you, Margie. Stephanie, your thoughts? Yeah, that's an interesting question. There are a few things that we probably could have done better that we didn't know much about. And I'm not so sure it was your job to tell me that, but I didn't know a lot about HR. And, and even though there were some things given to me, I just kind of assumed that was everything. And a few years into it, I realized I needed to learn a lot more. Um, uh, safety and OSHA regulations, a few years into it, I realized we need to kind of step up our game and make sure that we're documenting that we're doing these things to be safe. Um, the other thing was uh, little things like merchant services. How do you pick a good merchant services or a good phone system. And some of that is not as it's, it's different than it was 14 years ago, certainly. Um, you know, we went with an old system 14 years ago. Since then, we've converted to uh, VIP, VOP, whatever it's called. Um, just, just a lot of little things that, you know, you just, even if they told me it just doesn't also, Kim, it takes a little bit of Very time. Very good. Yeah, definitely. Jack, any additional comments there? You know, I, I, I think they've answered it well. I, I think it's uh, also the willingness to delegate. Uh, we become control freaks and we really need to pass things off. In corporate life, we're willing to delegate, but when you're owning your own business, it's my money and my reputation and it's hard to pass things off and you become the bottleneck of the business. So the better you can hire properly and delegate as able to definitely helps. Very good. Thank you, Jack. All right. To our next guest, uh, Blaine, if you can take yourself off a of mute, tell the group where you're from geographically and go ahead with a question. Hi, everybody. Blaine Christopher here from Dallas, Texas. Uh, mine is pretty targeted. I'm really interested in the sandblasted wooden signs. And I was wondering if, if any of you are doing those yourselves in-house. And if not, if you're actually taking some orders and outsourcing them, if you're seeing any increase in that business or if it's staying pretty much the same. Okay, very good. Uh, let's start with Margie this time. Margie, sandblasted signs. Sure. Um, so that's done usually with a, a substrate called HDU. Um, it's not really our design aesthetic. We do a lot of really kind of modern um, clean finishes. So if we did one, we would outsource it. There's some really great people um, who actually do it and then they cover it and um, actually a, like a liquid, um, metal so they can make them look shiny and, and almost plaque like so there's lots of opportunities with substrates and and to make them look differently but um, that's not really our our lane 
Okay, very good. How about you, Stephanie? I think she said it best. It's not something that we focus on very much. We've done it a few times. Uh, we've had other people do it. We don't, we haven't invest, invested the material to do it. I suppose um, where you're living could, could dictate that. I don't think of Dallas as being heavy on that. I think of it being more like a, a beachy situation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, we have the capability to mimic that on our CNC machine and have done, you know, wood grains and some unique things to, to get texture. It's, it's all about texture, but there's so much more than um, doing just sandblasted that, that we just haven't gotten into it. Very good. Thank you, Stephanie. And Dr. Mike, who is also in Texas, how big is that market down there? And what's your thoughts about sandblasted signs in Texas? I've had zero inquiries and I've done zero of them. Uh, <clears throat> recommendation I would have would be just drive around and see if they're up in your neck of the woods or not. But if they are, and you want to focus on that, that could be an interesting niche. But you've got to marry the market need and capabilities and desire. Yep, absolutely. Very good. Thank you. Okay, let's go to our next guest, uh, Cedric. I see a couple questions in your Q&A box here. Um, we'll take off your mute and go ahead with one of the two questions, please. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Cedric Steele. I'm out in the uh, Naperville, Illinois uh, area, just outside of Chicago. Um, what I was curious about, um, when you think about the time from startup to where you got to a level to where you really felt you were hitting your, your stride, that, that is in terms of feeling comp competent, and getting at a steady level of income. Can you just describe a little bit about what that timing looked like and if there was any particular points where you felt like, hey, now I get it, I've got this. All right, let's start with uh, Dr. Mike. Have you figured it out yet? Uh, pretty much, and it, it took a while to figure it out. Now, keep in mind, I opened my doors November of 19. And we all know what happened to the world in March of 20. So my story is a little different than most. You know, I went into deep time scramble mode early on, but I survived. Uh, I was also in a position where I was focused on growth. You know, coming out of an entrepreneurial background, you have to get scale to survive. And that was my focus. Uh, this year it's on profitability. And I would say about year two, I felt like, okay, I've got a good handle on the business. It was year three and a half to four for me to answer the profitability, reliability, all that, but it wasn't my focus. So, it, you know, keep that in mind. My focus was to grow the company knowing that the profit, profitability will follow. Okay, and comfort level as far as understanding the business and just what, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, where do you feel like that's kicked yeah. in? Yeah, that was, yeah, that, that was, three to six months in at, at most. I mean, it's it's not a complicated business. The key is hiring that first person correctly and they will guide you on everything. Hey, this is the material, here's the terminology, here's how we do it, here's how long it's gonna take to install. And I mean, I'll bring somebody in, I brought two people on as admins with no sign company knowledge and they could talk signs in 60 days. Very good. Margie? Um, I think that's a sim we have a similar um, story. We really were doing great and growing quickly and at two years in and then COVID. Um, so that we actually changed our entire business model for a year from being a B2B to be, to be a B2C um, to survive COVID. And then we got back on track again. Um, and our B2B business is um, definitely profitable and you know we got a really good handle on our uh, numbers and how to we um specifically sell what uh, is profitable and that you know sell more of what makes money so that was it doesn't seem too complicated um i learn something new every day which that's what i love about this is everything we do is custom so it's some of it is repeatable, but there's just so much newness and I love to be an innovator and I love to look at new ideas. So for me personally, um, I, I like to um, do things that are maybe not even done before. So um, that's the really exciting part for me. 
Very good. Thank you, Margie. Stephanie? I think depending on the day, I'm still feeling like I'm figuring it out. There, there are, there is so much to learn and so much to do. And like Margie said, it is a blast learning to do something different with a machine or doing a different product. And that's what makes it fun. As far as early on, when did we do that? We started in 09 when the economy was bad as well. So it was a challenging time. And, um, certainly there was a big learning curve we hadn't been to entrepreneurial school and and i was an accountant and and so there were lots of things to learn but that's kind of the fun of all of it and and then it seems like every six months we're a different company because we're growing because we're adding things because we're doing things different and um so it's it's a constant process I don't want to get too comfortable. I, I think it's important that I, it, it's not going to be like making donuts and I've got it down perfect and I can just skate for years to come now. It's it's one of those things that you grow, you help your clients grow, um, you stay up with technology and have a lot of fun with it. Very good. Thank you, Steph. All right, let's go to our next participant. If I can ask Joanne to take yourself off of mute and go ahead with a question for the group today. Sure, hi everybody. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see me, hold on. Where's my video? No, videos are not uh, on for participants, so just your audio. Oh, oh okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So my question is, how much of your business is repeat business and what is your ROI? So ROI in the sense of? Return on investment. Right, but do you mean from the initial investment or are you talking currently? Just wanna make sure we understand the question. I mean, current would be preferable, yeah. So are you referring to their net profit percent when you say ROI or when did they recover their investment from a timeline perspective? Um, a lot of questions whatever in there. Capital that they're, whatever capital they're putting, they've put into the business, what's, what's their return okay. on it? When did they recover on it? Okay. So what percent is repeat for your customer base and when did you recuperate your investment in the business? If you have done so already. So um, Stephanie, you've been at it the longest. I'm not sure if you remember, but we'll start with you first. Yeah, I'm not so sure I do. So I'll answer the other part first. Um, a, a lot of repeat and referral. It, it's all about making somebody happy and then asking for introductions and, and that next person and, and just growing and growing. That is certainly the way we grow and it's huge. 80 to 90% repeat or referral. Um, business for us. And we enjoy that. As far as return on investment, I, I'm sorry. I was listening to your questions, um, Jeannie, as far as what it is I should be calculating. And um, certainly it's been very profitable, but I okay. don't have any numbers for you. So, and again, I know this is going back quite a bit. So let's think about this. Let's frame it up this way. Okay. If you invested in Sign World and the total amount you put into it, at what time do you believe you made enough profit in the business to pay that off? And just a range, if you don't remember exactly, because I know it's been a long time for you. Um, so some of those investments, it might have been five years in before we fully paid everything back and were clear. And I'm I'm taking a guess on that, and and that could have and been awesome. due, done sooner or slower. It's just a matter of how you want to do it, right? And we'll add that Stephanie now has a ten thousand square foot building and a lot of additional equipment, so she's put additional investments in her business too. So that is a hard answer there. Um, let's go to Margie. Sure. Percent repeat, um, and when do you think you recuperated your initial investment? Yeah. So um, honestly, we definitely reinvest in our business all the time. We're buying new equipment, we're getting more tools, we're buying a vehicle, we're constantly you know, hiring more people. So it's kind of a moving target. Um, so as we scale, you know, we need more stuff. Um, but we're more profitable when we do more in-house. So 
in the beginning, you know, we were much more outsourced and um, less in-house production. And then we were trying to flip that number. So even last year, I would say we were 55 percent um, internal, no, 55 percent um, vended products and 45 percent internal. And we're flipping that this year. Um, so I would say we were like from a tax perspective, we were a break even around year three. Um, we made a little bit of money last year. We were profitable, but I mean, the first quarter this year was phenomenal for us. Um, so it, that's really kind of been the big uptick for us. And, um, I mean, we, in the very beginning, our business was a third, a third, a third, a third um, pay-per-click, a third referrals, and a third networking. Um, and now we still get some pay-per-click, but a lot of those we turn away because they're just not big enough uh, customers for us. And we refer them to another sign world in our area um, so that they can help grow their business. Um, and the big things that we do every day and all day long, and we call them partners, is the lion's share of our business. Very good. Thank you, Margie. How about you, Dr. Mike? Uh, I would guesstimate, and I, I need to take a close look at 25 to 40% of repeat customers. Uh, our customers are thrilled with us. So when they do have a need, they definitely come back to us. Um, but I need to probably take a close look at that. As far as the ROI question, honestly, I don't have an answer for you. I couldn't even tell you because like everyone else is saying, I've been reinvesting the company. I bought a five by 10 uh, CNC machine. I bought a laser, I bought a truck. Uh, all these are assets that allows me to capture more capabilities and profits in the future. So I've not, never even tried to do a back of the envelope uh, calculation on that. But if I had to make a guess when I get that back, Probably next year, I mean, but that's just a, you know, a wag, and we all know what that stands for. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Mike. All right, let's go to our next guest. Um, Darren, if you can take yourself off of mute. Oh, you know what? Looks like Darren hopped off. So let's go on to the next one. I see Jason. Hold on. Some names were there, and now they're not. So I'm just double checking who's still on. I'm going to go to the Q&A box. I see, and I'm going to pronounce your name, hopefully right. Yogan um, is having a problem with his headset, so he can't come off a of mute. So I'm going to ask this question for him. What was your biggest challenge starting in year one, and how did you resolve it? That almost sounds like an interview question. I remember being asked that in interviews. What was your biggest <laughs> challenge, and how did you fix it? <laughs> uh, Margie, let's start with you. Um, gosh, uh, my biggest challenge. I... I think it was just believing in myself, right? Um, that I could really do it. Um, I had this amazing sign maker um, who was with me for a really long time. He just left last May, but um, we just believing what I was saying was was probably my biggest challenge that, you know, wow, I, I think I know what I'm saying. Um, and then I was thrown out a price and hoping, you know, that it was the right thing. And um, I've overthought everything. Um, so don't overthink it. You really just, you know, don't spend so much time trying to come up with the exact number because it's it's kind of meaningless. Just they are, they aren't, they like you, they don't. Um, just, just dive in, get, get in the pool. Very good. Dr. Mike, biggest challenge in your first year. Uh, no, no doubt about it. It's this thing called COVID. It threw everything on its ear. Uh, I mean, I was, you know, a good example, like March would have been my fourth month opening. I was projecting a $40,000 booking month. We did 12 and all that was in the first part. Uh, but what it forced us to do was to get creative. And we, we, you know, I made the strategic decision not to chase a lot of the COVID protection stuff. If business came my way, fine. But I made the strategic decision to stay the course, chase the type of jobs that I want to have down the road, which would fuel growth later on, which it did. But with COVID, it really became, and luckily we're here in Texas where we opened up quicker, uh, but it was raw material availability. It, that really became a big issue year one and year two. Luckily that's pretty much behind us now, supply chain, but 
uh, COVID and what it did to finances, work environment, and all that was by far the answer. And you can't prepare for okay. a pandemic. That's very true. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Stephanie, how about you? What was your biggest challenge the first year? How'd you solve it? And so a little different in that I did not join uh, the business full-time for a couple of years. So I was working a full-time job to make sure we had enough money to, to get through it and had health insurance and then scooting in at 5, 5.30 in the evening and working for many hours. So the long hours were challenging at first for us. And that was our choice to do it that way. I think if you talk to Bob, who was in it full time right from the very beginning, he would talk about um, establishing that customer base, learning how to network and be involved with people and, and getting his name out there. And then pricing was a challenge. Um, I'd encourage everybody to spend a diligent amount of time setting up their system in pricing so that they're comfortable with that and, and making sure you start that off right. Very good. Thank you. Margie? I answered. Oh, I'm sorry. I started with you. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Let's go to our next guest. Um, Lawrence, I do see a question in the Q&A, but if you're able to go off mute and ask it yourself, it looks like you're unmuted. Yeah. Hi from downtown Chicago. Uh, Chicago. Well, <clears throat> it's been a long time. Seattle. Um, you know, everything sounds great, uh, but the territory I'm being offered is literally right next to, and, and it's a person I know, uh, coincidentally, another Sign World franchise. So how does that collaboration, cooperation, competition realistically happen with the franchises and territories? Great question. Thinking about competition, both your Sign World colleagues as well as other sign companies. Let's expand it just a slight bit too. Uh, Margie, let's start with you. Oh my gosh, I love this question. Um, from my desk, I'm looking across the parking lot and I can see another sign company. And I can look out the um, across the street and I can see another sign company. Um, literally within you know a 30 second walk. It's irrelevant. Um, there is so much business that it, it doesn't matter at all. I would say that um, the person across the street, I in five years, I've... Um, we've shown up on this working to get the same job once. And um, the person across the parking lot is does a totally different product category. Um, the really exciting thing I can tell you is that my very first year in business, my biggest customer was another sign company. So you can um, get out there and introduce yourself. Um, if you aren't busy and you have um, a staff that can do labor, people would ask you to, you know, can you bring your person over? Can I drop stuff off? I did a ton of um, banners and taping here for the Amazon distribution centers my first year. Um, I whatever they needed um, weeded for car wraps, I would do that just to you know help generate income. And it was really successful for us to, to do that. Very good, thank you, Margie. We're gonna go to Dr. Mike next to answer the question. Um, but before we do, Sheree, can you go ahead and start the slideshows in the background? Uh, there's gonna be some slides shown to our participants on different types of signs, signs that can be done in-house and outsourced. Um, some of the Hall of Fame or unique projects our owners have done, as well as some owner profile pictures. So that will be going on in silent mode in the background as we continue. Um, so one more question for you, Dr. Margie. If another sign owner was to open up next door, would you view that as a competition? Or what's your thoughts about other sign world companies in your area? Um, I think we're all whether they're sign world or they're in a franchise or they're somebody else independently owned, it's, they're all kind of equal. And I think you figure out what you're, what you're good at and, and your, what differentiates you from everyone else. And it's fine. And so another sign world is, is welcome. And in fact, anything that I don't want to do, I, I say call Liberty. So um, they're just down the street and I, I hope that I can help support her business and she can grow. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Mike, you live in Austin with quite a few owners nearby. Thoughts on other sign yeah. companies and those sign world companies? So as far as competition, I got a real simple adage. I don't worry about them. I let them worry about me. Uh, as far as the sign world companies here, when I was going through the same stage you are, I was able to meet face-to-face -face with each and every one of them with one exception. 
and Jack told me up front, you'll never get a meeting with this guy. Uh, spent a lot of time with Helen with SaberSign during the due diligence process. And we collaborate all the time. If she needs something or out of something, hey, I got, I need some help. I, you know, she had a vehicle wrap installer not show up for a project. I sent my guy down. Uh, so we actually work along really well. Now, the other one, Jack told me, he's like, look, he just considers every sign company a competition. It took me about four to six months uh, sending him over referrals for everything I couldn't do, but it was in his uh, area of expertise. And finally, I was like, hey, can you, let's meet for coffee. Let's meet for coffee. And finally, he goes, okay, I guess I'll owe you a cup of coffee. We met for an hour. And since then, he is my electrical sign contractor that installs every single electrical sign. He makes all the big ones for me. We just did a huge project. So he's making money. I make money. It's really worked out incredibly well, but it did take some effort to get to know him, but everyone else has been wonderful. Okay, very good. How about you, Stephanie? You've been part of the Sign World family for a long time. What are your thoughts? Um, do you know, we're all so different and I hope you can see even between the three of us, we're all so different and and focus on different things that it's it's not a competition and you can't possibly make every kind of sign there is. So anytime you can get somebody close to you that can help and specialize in one of those areas, it's gonna strengthen you. Um, it, it's really not a problem. When we did our, our first uh, business plan, I remember we saw two sign companies that were kind of, we considered our competition, but it was a stretch competition. It was like, they seemed so far away. They had been around for years and years and years, and we thought they do such cool stuff. They're not in business anymore. It's just, it, it's, it's surprising. If, if you do it right, you can be successful no matter what. I, I wouldn't worry about anybody close, and I enjoy people that I can talk to and share that responsibility with. Very good, thank you. All right, let's go to our next participant. Uh, I believe Vince, you haven't had a chance to ask a question. If you can take yourself off a of mute and go ahead for a question. Uh, uh, number one, uh, thanks everybody for uh, uh, presenting uh, to us and answering the questions. This has been great. Uh, a lot of questions. So our, you know, I was uh, most of my questions were being answered. So I do have one more. So if you I'm hearing that you're outsourcing, and that's what I was going to ask. What jobs does it make sense to outsource versus uh, doing them internal? Okay. Uh, let's start with you, Stephanie. What would you consider to do in-house versus outsource, and why? I'd start with everything that I can do on my printer and my laminator and that package that we've been given. Then as you find yourself outsourcing certain things more and more, then you would consider equipment that would allow you to bring that in-house and that truly depends on your market your area we looked at it one day and said hey we're spending a lot of money to have somebody else make ada signs we should be able to do that ourselves so we brought it in but i couldn't have decided that my first year because i really didn't understand the market or the business that i was going to get so um even now, we're not UL certified. We have somebody else make those channel letters. We now have the space to do it, and we might reevaluate that. But when it's my competitors that only make channel letters, and there's three companies around close by that do that, and they're all racing to the bottom on price, I don't necessarily get motivated to bring that in-house. I'd rather do something else that's unique, and I can capture that market. And so it becomes very different from city to city, uh, from shop to shop, and from skill set. If I can't, if I need something and I need a machine, but I can't get an operator to operate that with skill, then maybe that's not a good thing to go into. Very good. Very good answer. It kind of goes back to that ROI question earlier and making sure that when you do invest in more equipment, you have the ROI to do that. So um, let's go on to Dr. Mike. Yeah, so we outsource all banners except for rush jobs. Uh, we're starting to outsource more of 
in quantity, smaller signs. Uh, there's a vendor of Science 365 that does great work and fast and everything else. So we always ask ourselves is, are we better off making it ourselves if we can, or do we get better value of outsourcing and then I can put those people doing something else? In the beginning, you're gonna do it all because it's experience. Uh, electrical signs I outsource, ADA I outsource, uh, but if I can make it in-house, I generally prefer to. I have control, which I like control. I control my timing, schedule, quality, and all that jazz. But there's some things, it just doesn't make sense, like electrical science. The amount of investment it would take for me to do that is not worth the energy. I can buy it from a wholesale supplier, have it go to my installer, they put it up, I project manage it, and make okay money at it. Uh, but I've got very little hard dollars into it. And I like those projects. So it's kind of case by case, but take advantage of your outsourced suppliers, especially before you open up because you can get pretty much everything done. Very good, thank you, Dr. Mike. Margie? Um, gosh, Dr. Mike almost you know hit it right on the head, exactly what we do. Um, we outsource channel letters, um, we, we're never the cheapest price. And so, you know, we always put on the margin that we want for outsourced um, so that it's probably not as good as if we made it in house, but um, if we lose the job, then we're okay with that. So really for us, because we're gonna give um, a value proposition, which is gonna be service and quality over price, um, that's how we approach our outsourced um, product. And as we grow and get more resources, I mean, we would love to do um, ADA in-house and other things that just um, right now, that's not part of our value proposition, but it would be long-term. Very good, thank you, Margie. All right, let's go to our next guest. Uh, and I think it's the last one to ask a question. Aaron, if you can take yourself off the of mute and go ahead with a question for today. Yes, uh, hello everyone. And Laura's here with me as well. Um, appreciate you all taking the time. Um, one of the questions that we have is, obviously each of you run a different business and you've been in it for a different amount of time, but if you could pick really just one element that was the key to building momentum and growth in your business, what is that one thing that you would maximize for growth? Very good. Let's uh, go back to you, Margie. What would you say is the number one thing that would maximize your growth? Um, so we've spent the last two years being really diligent about um, identifying who the ideal customer is. And once we knew who that was, then we were able to... Um, we actually rebranded our, our website. We were able to um, reach out to those customers. Everything we do is based on um, those types of uh, customers that we want long-term. Um, they're repeatable. They're um, not spending their own money. It's corporate money usually. And um, that's exactly what we said we wanted to do. And that's what we do today. Um, but in the beginning, it was, you know, like a high school mom with a graduation banner and just learning how to do that. And then it, you know, it just grows into whatever you want your business to be. Very good. Stephanie? Margie, your answer was much more um, mature than mine. I would just go back to pricing. Um, <laughs> just being being bold about um, what, what your pricing things at, making sure you're you're making the money. If you're not making the money on it, then it's not something you need to be working on and doing. Very good. How about you, Dr. Mike? Two words, be aggressive. And what do I mean by that? Invest in social, in your pay-per-click, uh, invest in people. Don't be hesitant. If you even sense a need that it's time to hire somebody, hire them. Uh, and this is specifically with a growth attitude in mind. A uh, customer comes in and says, hey, it's not why should we not, it's how do we figure it out? Uh, now, growth mode does not necessarily equal profit mode when you're doing that. So you're also building up skill sets, capabilities, knowledge, that at some point you do transfer it into profit, or at least that, that was my experience. Uh, I would also suggest that 
you're going to need to push your people to think bigger than what they can think because they look at it. How could, you know, I remember going to them saying, okay, we did 500 last year. We're going to do a million this year. 800 is the goal. And they looked at me like I was nuts. It was like, no, guys, we can do it. Well, we did a million. Why? Because I kind of forced the issue, but I was also willing to invest in the business to add people and add capabilities. So it can definitely be done. You can grow it as fast or as little as you want. I mean, there's definitely stories of stupendous growth in the first year or two. Uh, I mean, you know, definitely heard some of those stories recently, but it also comes down to your comfort level. Are you really willing to invest what's needed to grow fast? And again, I'll use pay-per-click as a great example. When I first started out, there's some people, oh, yeah, I'll throw 100, 200 bucks at it. I started out at 500 and I'm quickly bumped up to a thousand a month. Why? Because that was how I was able to get leads coming in the door. And it's leads in the door, answering the leads, closing on the leads, and delivering on the leads. That's how you're going to get growth. And your ability to do so in a timely manner matters. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Um, unfortunately, I overlooked one of our guests, and I apologize, Lewis. If you can go ahead and take yourself off of mute and go ahead with the question that you have for today. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, everybody, for the great information y'all are providing. Um, I'm in, my name's Lewis. I'm in Katy, Texas, which is outside of Houston. Pretty far, uh, but it's, it's Houston's pretty close. Um, but I wanted to know, I'm not a sign expert by any means. I, I think the main thing that I know about signs is you don't want to have misspelled words on them. So I don't know anything about technical. I don't know anything about the machines. I, I watched the videos that um, showed, you know, some of the sample franchise owners who were, you know, showing off their offices and looking at their equipment. I have no idea what any of that equipment does or anything. So I want to know from the owners here, um, how long does, or how, what is the process for learning this type of information? How long does it take before you can speak intelligently? I, um, I've been in the sales world for about the last 10 years, and I know that you want to have more information about what you do than the customer, prospective customer has. So I want to be able to answer technical questions. I want to be able to understand what all the machines do, how they work, how to troubleshoot them, that type of thing. Uh, and just how to become an expert on signs, since I know nothing about signs. Great question. I love this one. So I'm going to add to it. First question is, did you know anything about signs when you joined Sign World? And two, how did you become the expert that you are today? So let's start with you, Dr. Mike. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I knew nothing about signs going in. It took me... Actually, I was pretty comfortable talking about stuff in the next, in the first 45 days or so. But I think one of the other lessons I learned a long time ago in sales is number one, you don't guess. And I think you're alluding to that too. But two, hey, that's a great question. I had not thought of that. Let me go check with the experts back at the office. Then you go back, you check, and you go back to the customer and say, okay, here's what I found. Uh, you don't need credibility like what you're talking about. You need to have somebody who has that credibility and you're going to get that with your first hire. So I wouldn't let that worry you or anything like that. The machines, what they do and how they do it, you'll figure that out during training. That there's no doubt about. Now, for you to be able to operate them, heck, I don't want to operate most of them. I can if I had to, but I sure don't want to. That's what I got people for. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Stephanie? I knew nothing going into this. However, think about it. Have you ever known any kid that said, I want to grow up and be a sign maker? Have you ever oh. seen any college that offered a degree in sign making? It's one of the few industries where the information is passed down by word of mouth. Mostly you can read books on it, but mostly we are, we teach each other how to do these things. And there is something very, very cool about that. Um, it takes a special kind of person to be creative, but be an engineer, to be um, to be able to do big, rugged stuff, but be very meticulous and tidy. Um, it's it's a special skill set, but it's it's more how you're wired to do that. 
And honestly, you're going to hire somebody that's going to help you learn. Our first hire still works with us today. He's great. He still answers questions every single day. That's his main responsibility is to field questions and to research things and find out different products that will work better. He's the expert at that. He has other people that help him do that, but um, it'll come to you. And I agree with what Mike said, and that is that you defer to your team that is going to help you figure that out. Um, you're going to have customers that have different likes and dislikes. You've got different people on your team that are going to be experts at gnarly tattoo looks that I don't hold yet. <laughs> And I've got people that can help me do that. So I can I can help anybody because I've got a school team. Very good. Thank you, Stephanie. Margie, your thoughts? Um, I, just like everyone else, I had no sign knowledge at all. And um, I learned a lot in training and I got back here and I've never used it once. <laughs> Everything that gets done is done by um, the sign maker, our production team, installers, outsourced, that kind of thing. Um, I've really totally committed to sales. And um, I just like talking to people. I like being um, in a networking environment. And that's really just kind of my, I'm the face of the business. So that's where my value is. That's where my high value time is spent. And, you know, being more visionary um, is what's helping us grow and scale. Very good. Thank you, Margie. Uh, there was another question sent to me directly that I'm going to ask for the guests. Um, it's a very direct question. So owners feel free to uh, pass if you don't feel like sharing. But Going back to financials, your average net profit margin today, not looking at the early years, but where are you at today, if you're willing to share? And when you think about net profit, that's not just what the business is making, but including your own um, earnings in that. Do you have any idea what that uh, percent would be? I'm going to start with Dr. Mike, because I, I fear he might say he doesn't know, because it kind of sounds like that's where he is <laughs> on his financials, but uh, I'm going to start yeah. asking. I'll start with you. No, I think... This year is shaping up uh, nicely, which was the goal of mine. Um, just looking at it, probably hanging about 8%, 10% net. Uh, but I also was a little heavy on personnel to begin the year with. So now that I've rationalized that, it'll probably be more in the 15%, give or take. But keep in mind, I do a lot of dollars that are associated with electrical signs that are completely outsourced so that brings my gross margins overall down from the 75 percent that jack talks about anything in-house is 75 but so there's some dichotomies there yep absolutely margie how about you um so from a QuickBooks perspective, I mean, we look at uh, cost of goods plus payroll, so cost of manufacturing, and we try to run that at 50%. So um, sometimes we hit that goal, not always, but I would say last year, not. We were probably like 64% of cost of manufacturing. This year, we're, we raised our prices and um, no one flinched. So we're, we're really close to that 50, and that's made a gigantic difference in being profitable. And then just having more sales right so if you have more sales you get more profit very good how about you stephanie interesting uh, to to listen to both of you so i would say um uh to margie's question we are at about 55 to 60 percent um but then we're um when we're talking about mike's comparison we're more 18 to 20. so okay. very, very good very good well, it is the top of the hour, and I know Dr. Mike is at a customer site or on his way to get one, so I want to make sure we're very uh, uh, conscious of their time and their commitment here. So first off, uh, Stephanie, Margie, and Dr. Mike, thank you for giving this hour of your time, sharing your perspectives and, and your honesty and, and your insights. It's, it's always very helpful for those considering sign world, so we appreciate you very much. So thank you for that. And to our participants, thank you for joining today. Thanks for having the interest in learning more about Sign World. Uh, our corporate team looks forward to the continued conversations with you to help you make that decision if this is the right chapter for you and your lives. And with that, I will conclude our session today. So I hope everybody has a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks for joining me. Take care. Thanks, guys.